the lives of his people and how God is working in our lives. We come to the time now where God builds a nation. And we have a summarization of that building of the nation in the chapter 2 of the book. God has destroyed the earth by a flood. After the flood is over, Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives come out of the ark. The world has been cleansed and life begins anew for all of those that were in the ark, both man and animal. From that point, men began to multiply and to spread out throughout the, or throughout the world. And they developed and began to worship other gods. There were the gods of fertility. There were the gods of the harvest. There were the gods of, of the rain. There were many different gods that men created in their own minds and out of their own understanding. Men tried to build a tower to reach to the heavens to once again become like God as Adam and Eve became like God when they ate of the fruit and became aware of knowledge of good and evil. When the Tower of Babel was built, God sent the men and the women who built it, spread them throughout the, uh, throughout the world, and confused their languages. But God was not through with mankind because God wanted a testimony of Himself in the world. And as God looked down from heaven, He found another righteous man, a man who worshipped only Him, the true God. This man was Abraham. Or Abram. He lived in the land of the earth of the Chaldees, and God spoke to him and called him and said, I want you to leave your people and I want you to go to a land that I'm going to show you. And as Abram traveled, he was able to speak of the one true God. He was able to worship the one true God. And he ended up in the land of promise that God had told him that he was going to. To receive. On page 15 of the book, we find that at the very bottom of the page, right above the little open space, there's one sentence Abram believed God, and he credited it to him as righteousness. That one sentence is found several times in the New Testament. It's referenced at least six times that I'm aware of where the faith of Abraham is pointed out as the only way to find righteousness with God. God has promised Abraham that he is going to make of him a, 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 a man who has many nations that is to come from him that his descendants will be as the stars of the sky or as the sand of the sea. And God promises that the descendants are to come from his own being, from he and Sarah's own intimate relationship, and they are going to have a son. That promise is 25 years in the making. Uh, Noah, or not Noah, but uh, Moses and Sarah tried to understand God's promise, God's covenant relationship with them, and, and they try to uh, figure out a way that they're going to bring about the result of God's promise, and as a result, a son is born to a 
uh, slave girl, and Ishmael becomes the firstborn son of Noah, or of Moses. Abraham. What can I say? i got too many names running around right now. But becomes the firstborn. Ishmael is actually the firstborn. Physically, but he is not the son of Sarah. Now what was done was completely okay in the culture of that day. It was something that uh, any couple would do that were infertile of having someone else to become the surrogate mother or the mother of a child so that the parent's name, the father's name could continue. When Ishmael is 14 years old, Sarah has a son. His name is Isaac. We're going to come back and look at Abraham and Isaac in a few moments, but I want to go forward because Isaac becomes the father of Jacob. As God establishes a kingdom, or a people after his own name, he starts with Abraham or with Abraham. And the promise is carried down through Isaac. And then Isaac has 12 sons. And his name is changed to Israel. As we look at the latter part of chapter 2, we find the story of Jacob and Esau, his brother, who were twins that came as a result of Isaac's marriage to Leah and Rachel. And, Israel, and Jacob wrestles with God. And because he has wrestled with God, his name is changed to Israel. Jacob means laughter. Israel means what? I forgot. Israel means he laughed. No, Jacob. Let's try again. Isaac is he laughs. Jacob becomes Israel, and I forgot Israel's name. Okay, those of you who are watching on television, I am human. I do make mistakes, and I do forget things. So I'm sorry. I apologize. But anyway, Jacob becomes Israel, and he becomes the father of Joseph, Benjamin, Reuben, Levi, Simeon, and twelve sons total. And it is through Israel that God's promised son comes. I want to go back to the story of Abraham and Isaac. And if you have your, your Bibles with you, the story Bible, I want you to look at page 19. Page 19. I have a story here that's very interesting. A story of a man who trusts God. A man whom God has entered into a covenant relationship with. And this man trust God totally and completely. For 25 years, Abraham and Sarah have been waiting for a child to be born. The child of the promise that God had made to them. They have attempted to short circuit God's promise. They have attempted to bring about God's promise by their own actions and that resulted, as we've seen earlier, in the birth of Ishmael. But Ishmael was not 
the promised one from God. God says, I am going to give you a son that comes from you, Abraham, and you, Sarah. And that child is born. And his name is Isaac. After he is born, he begins to grow. And he continues to grow until he is a young man of indeterminate age. We do not know how old Isaac is at the point of time that we come to this story. We know certain things about him that we will look at, but one night, sometime after Isaac is born, God spoke to Abraham. God tested Abraham. And God said, Abraham. And immediately upon hearing God call his name, Abraham says, Here I am. He responds to the Father. He responds to God. And he says, Here I am, God. You tell me, you speak to me what you want to say. And God says to Abraham, notice, take your son, your only son, the one whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. Take your son. Your only son. Your firstborn son. Your son of the promise that I have made to you. Take him, Abraham, and go to a place that I will show you. And there, sacrifice him. In the middle of the night, God speaks. Abraham says, here I am. And God gives him this instruction. Now, if it was you and I, or you and me that were there, and God spoke to us that way, what would we say to God? Abraham immediately rose up from his bed loaded his donkeys called two of his servants and then Abraham started cutting the wood for the sacrifice. He calls two servants and he takes Isaac. And as the three men are waiting, Abraham cuts the wood for the sacrifice. Abraham doesn't tell them anything according to the story here. We do not know the rest of the story. As far as what happened, as what was in Abraham's mind, what was in Isaac's mind. But early that morning, Abraham acts in total and complete obedience to God. And then he and Isaac and the two servants set out on a journey. They walk from the southernmost part of the land that is now called Israel from the area of Beersheba and they walk north for three days to the place 
that God has said for Abram to go. He says, I want you to go to the region of Moriah. Moriah is in what we now know as Jerusalem. It was the area to which Abram was going. It was a three-day journey. And Abram and Isaac walked. What did they talk about? We don't know. What did God, uh, what did Abraham say to God as he was walking with his son? What did he say to God? God, why, why are you doing this? God, you, you gave me this son. Why, why do you want me to sacrifice him now? We, your promises are not going to be fulfilled. What is God, or what is Abraham saying to God? Is he arguing with God? Or is he completely saying, God, I don't understand what you're doing. But you know, I trust you, God. I'm going to walk with you. I'm walking here with my son and we're going to the place that you told us to go and I am going to do what you command me to do. Two different ways of understanding what Abraham is doing. Questioning God or submitting to God. Abraham is trusting God. But for three days we have this silence as they walk. And then on the third day, Abraham looks up. And there in the distance, he sees the mount. He sees Moriah. He sees the place where he is supposed to sacrifice his son. Now according to 2 Chronicles chapter 3, Moriah, the place where Abraham is going to sacrifice Isaac. It's the same place where the temple was later built. It's where the Holy of Holies stood when the temple was built. And when Abraham sees that place, he turns to his two servants and he says, You remain here. Isaac and I am going, or are going, up to the mountain. And there we will worship. Now Isaac must have been a young man. He must have been a teenager or something. Because Abraham takes all of the wood for the sacrifice and puts it on Isaac's back and shoulders. And they begin to walk. Now as Isaac is carrying the wood for the sacrifice, Abraham is carrying the fire in one hand and the knife in the other hand. He has both of the instruments, both of the items that can hurt his son, the fire and the knife, and he himself is carrying them to protect his son. And as they walk to the hill, as they walk to the mount, Isaac looks up at his dad. And he says, Father? Yes, son. Here I am. Same thing that Abraham said to him. Here I am. Father? I'm carrying the wood. You've got the knife and the fire. Where's the sacrifice? Where's the animal we are going to sacrifice if we're going to worship? And Abraham looks at his son Isaac. And he says, Isaac, God will provide. For three days, Abraham is talking with God. 
And Abraham comes to understand that God is going to provide. The scripture says that Abraham had come to the belief that even if he sacrificed Isaac, and Isaac died, that God would raise Isaac from the dead. Abraham's belief was strong. He trusted God. And Isaac trusted his father. And they came to the mountain, came to the spot where the sacrifice was going to occur, and Abraham built an altar out of the rocks. And then he took the wood from his son's shoulders and he laid the wood on the altar. And then he took Isaac, this young man who has carried all of the wood for the sacrifice, he takes Isaac and he binds Isaac with the rope. How much do you trust your father? Isaac trusted Abraham. Isaac had no concept, no idea, at least as far as we know, what Abraham was doing. Isaac, as far as we know, doesn't know that God has spoken to his father, Abraham, and said, do this. But here is a strapping young man who is allowing himself to be bound by his father. Now, I'm certain that Isaac, by this time, has figured out, hey, I'm going to be the sacrifice. But you notice... He doesn't fight his father. He trusts his father Abraham. Abraham binds Isaac, then picks him up and lays him on the altar of sacrifice. The fire is ready to go. And Abraham takes the knife. Now put yourself in Abraham's place. What are you thinking? What's going on here? I know that God's going to provide. I know that God can raise my son from the dead. But yet I still have this knife and I still have to put it into his throat to cut the carotid artery so that he will slowly bleed to death. And then I'm going to burn his body. As Abraham starts to plunge that knife in. Abraham! Abraham, wait! The angel speaks. Here I am. Immediately, Abraham says, Here I am to the angel of the Lord. Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now that I know you fear God, because you have not held your with from me your son, your only son. Now I know, God says. You see, Abraham had believed God in faith. But faith without works is a dead faith. Sometimes we are asked to do things by God. We are put in positions by God so that we have to make a choice. Do we trust God or do we trust ourselves? Or do we try to figure out another way? You fear God when you reverence Him, when you trust Him, when you obey Him, regardless of what the cost may be. You see, our faith is perfected when God tests us. You know, it's not easy to, to, to gather up your family and, and leave and go to a foreign nation. 
or even to leave South Georgia and go to Kansas as a young man. I had no idea when I left Valdosta, Georgia to go to Lawrence, Kansas to attend the university what God had planned for me in my life. But He had planned for me to meet the perfect woman. He had planned for me to do different things, to become, to, to get into the military, into the chaplaincy, etc., etc. God had these plans for me and, and I followed through with them, but I didn't always understand them. I didn't understand why some of the things happened to us that happened to us. But God has a plan. And all He wants from us is for us to be obedient and yielded to Him. And His way will work out. Amen. When Abraham pulled the knife back, he looked up, and there was a ram caught in the bushes. You know how rams eat? And many times they go to bushes and they stand up on their hind legs and their front legs are up on the bushes and they're eating out the bushes. Well, this ram got trapped. And God provided a ram for the sacrifice. Abraham's faith was completely verified by the ram that God provided. The scripture says, when he looked up, he saw the ram and he went over and he took the ram and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. You know, this is the first instance, instance in scripture where we have a substitutionary death where an innocent is sacrificed for a guilty. Where one life is given for another life. By faith, when God tested him, Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to them, to him, it is through Isaac that your offering will be reckoned, or your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. How much do you trust your father? Today we call God our father. Most of us here, our fathers have long since gone away from us. They have been taken in death and they're no longer with us. But how much do we trust our God today? Is your faith and my faith the same kind of faith that Abraham had? Sometimes God tests us to prove us, to perfect our faith, to make us to be more like what He wants us. To be. Years later, the scripture is written For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. As Jesus hung on the cross, dying, his last words were, Father! Into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus died so that you and I might live. A substitutionary death. The pre, uh, uh, pre known by the act of Abraham and Isaac. How much do you trust God today? How much do I trust God? Are we willing to do what God 
would have us to do. No matter how difficult it might be to submit to the will of God. Knowing that He has our perfect interest in mind. And His will becomes my will when I obey. We're going to stand and sing a hymn of dedication. Great is thy faithfulness. As we sing, we're going to remember the faithfulness of God. And all that He has promised to you and to I, or to you and to me, and to the people who believe in Him. Great is His faithfulness. Let's stand as we sing.